I think the way we teach math and science needs improvement. You see, I help kids 5 to 18 years old design, build, and program robots after school. From chihuahua-sized Lego Mindstorms robots to 120-pound fully custom robots designed, machined, fabricated by, believe it or not, kids. I've been mentoring youth robotics for three years now, and this experience has convinced me that the way you and I learned math and science doesn't prepare us adequately for the real world, stunts our creativity, and repels many people who might have otherwise excelled in these areas. So what's wrong with the way we were taught? Well, there are three things that I think are problematic. The first two are the obvious stereotypes. Math and science are often seen as boring, or at the other end of the spectrum, intimidating. So many kids are turned off of these topics for the wrong reasons, depriving us of any number of potential future Einsteins. Yet the kids who love these topics, who pursue them throughout high school and beyond, often find they don't know how to apply them in the real world. They don't know how to translate them into the workplace because they've never been taught how. So tell me, what makes math and science boring? Or even worse, intimidating? From what I've seen, it boils down to a few things. The obvious answers are pace and difficulty. So if a curriculum tends too far towards either side of this continuum, people react accordingly. A more subtle intimidation factor is the one right answer paradigm. So grade school math in particular is often taught via um, abstract equations that only have one right answer. And if you can't get it, then you're wrong. You feel stupid. It's embarrassing. And these negative emotions are compounded when there are learning disabilities involved. So how many brilliant dyslexic kids do you think are scared away from math and science because they struggle with reading? Despite having outstanding strengths in other areas, they think they're not smart enough for math and science, that they're not capable of it. Why? It's so obvious that it's often overlooked. It's because of our attitudes towards these topics. For some reason, we view math and science as being inherently difficult, or at least relatively more difficult than topics like languages, like sports, like arts. And whether we admit it or not, we compartmentalize people according to which topics they excel in. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, some people find it difficult to learn theory only. They need to interact physically with the material in order to stay engaged. Other people struggle more with the learning environment than with the material itself. They can't sit quietly in a desk, in a room, under fluorescent lights, just being still and listening to someone talk. But the main reason that people find math and science to be boring is because they can't see its relevance. They can't see how knowing it, how understanding it, can have a direct, profound impact on their lives. And it's hard to see this relevance when the only thing we're taught is how to calculate the rate of a train's travel from point A to point B, or which train is going to get to point B first. Why weren't we taught how to understand why the vehicle we need to get from point A to point B, maybe a robot, say, isn't working, or isn't working properly? This last example doesn't have any obvious math in it. It's hard to pin down exactly which disciplines you need to help you solve this problem. If we want to get this vehicle moving, we need a fundamental understanding of all of its parts. We need to know how they should work and how they should fail. And we need the creativity to imagine how the whole vehicle could fail if a bunch of tiny little things go wrong. And this is what happens to a lot of kids who love math and science. We get out into the real world, and now it's suddenly relevant, but we don't know how to get that hypothetical vehicle moving. We don't know how to apply what we learned in math, in chemistry, in physics. And we certainly don't know how to tease those individual disciplines out of a problem that combines them all. 
So learning just math or focusing on just one science is a little like working out just one arm. Sure, you're going to have one strong, really nice looking arm, but effectively you're limiting yourself to just a fraction of your true potential. And it's funny because this compartmentalization, this, this segregation that we see between the hard sciences, see we even call them hard, and everything else exists everywhere around us. As you heard, I did two undergraduate degrees, one in engineering and one in arts, the latter being in languages and computer science. And this gave me a pretty unique perspective. What I saw was predictable, but interesting. So the vast majority of the students in my engineering cohort were comfortable with calculations, but they would fall apart in our communications courses. And my peers in the arts were okay with writing and speaking and presenting, but they were terrified of anything that smacked of math and science. Whereas my counterparts in computer science, they were fluent in the language of details, but often they lacked the vision to see how small parts fit together into a jigsaw puzzle whole. And I bet that actually a lot of people in this room have this same feeling, but I think that the reason these stereotypes that have been observed by many people exist is because our society, and even more so our education system, perpetuates them in the way that we compartmentalize different forms of knowledge and arrange them into an artificial hierarchy. So this doesn't just happen between disciplines, it happens even in math and science, and even within a single discipline. If you want theory, go to university, be a scientist or be an engineer. If you want hands-on, go be a technologist or go get a trade. And never the twain shall meet until that tradesman gets plans from that engineer and says, it's not physically possible to design this this way. <laughs> Why don't you know that? You're supposed to be smart. And that's the thing, especially with math and sciences, we have this expectation that a higher education equates to a higher intelligence, when really, it's just an accumulation of a very specific type of knowledge. And that type of knowledge is wholly dependent on its hands-on counterpart when it comes to applying it in the real world. So why do we limit ourselves to just one of the two? Unfortunately, this compartmentalization that I saw in my peers during my undergraduate education is something I've continued to see everywhere. I see it in the undergraduate students that I help teach now that I'm a grad student. I see it in my coworkers in emergency services and forestry, some of whom never graduated from high school and yet they are amazingly capable problem solvers. I see it in the academics I interact with, in offices, in labs, at conferences. People who are revered as geniuses and yet they're not capable of operating a microwave or carrying on a conversation. <sighs> Why? Why do we limit ourselves to just a fraction of our potential? Well, because we're funneled into specific pigeonholes, and we don't want to, or we don't think we should, or we don't think we can escape them. Really, I think everybody in this room has some variation of this same attitude, myself included, where we purposefully limit our own potential. And whether we admit it or not, there are really strong emotional connections to the deep-seated beliefs that each of us have regarding what we can and cannot do, what we're capable of, what we're comfortable with. But where does this come from? Yeah, I can't do that. I'm, I'm not good at math. Oh yeah, I don't, I don't like public speaking. Well, I, I have a pretty good idea of where this comes from because I see that exact same attitude in the kids I work with. Not just the high schoolers, not just the middle schoolers, but even in the elementary school children, the five and six-year-olds that attend the youth robotics programs I'm involved with. And that's a pretty jaw-dropping thought, isn't it? That your feelings now, your skills, your strengths now, the way you interact with people, your environment, technology, the world, your education, your career, all of this was shaped by a five-year-old. And who or what shaped that five-year-old? Maybe parents? Maybe playmates? Maybe school? 
where kids spend the majority of their time learning bit by bit how to be adults. Now, you might have guessed by now that I am very strongly in favor of a holistic approach to teaching and learning, more specifically, one that incorporates all the parts of a real-world learning environment, i.e., a working environment. The problem-solving, the math and science, the communication, the teamwork, the creativity, and the hands-on experience that ties it all together. I think this is how we shape five-year-olds, 18-year-olds, even 50-year-olds into the innovators who are, in turn, going to shape our future. But how, how do we develop this good relationship with math and science if we don't know where to start, or if we have a previous negative experience that we need to overcome? Because, let's be honest, if you don't enjoy something, it doesn't matter how well it prepares you for the real world, you're still not going to enjoy it. If we want to ignite a passion for math and science in people of any age, we need to make it extremely accessible to everyone. And most importantly, we need to make it fun. Because passion doesn't come from what you have to do. It comes from what you want to do. Now imagine a learning environment where you're given real-world tasks or sets of challenges to solve, both individually and in teams. There's no such thing as one right answer. There could be hundreds, maybe thousands of ways you could choose to solve it. If um, you get to choose the difficulty level, you get to choose the pace. So if you want to focus on a single topic for an entire session, you can. You're guided and encouraged by mentors who are experienced problem solvers, who are passionate about the topics and care about you as an individual. And as you become more and more confident with the materials, you get more and more opportunities to apply it. So you're not just learning theory, you're also learning the aspects that are relevant to the workplace. You're learning the drafting, the welding, the machining, programming, project management, marketing, website design, community outreach. All of this taught in an environment that fosters innovation and critical thinking. Now, the only thing that's missing is what makes it fun. And that's up to you. What's your passion? Filmmaking? 3D printing? Maybe robots? So the learning environment I've just described is exactly what we try to create in the youth robotics programs that I'm involved with via the Schulich School of Engineering. So I have the experience to tell you how this type of learning environment impacts learners of all ages. We give the kids um, challenges to solve, and they're only allowed to use robot parts. And uh, it's up to them to choose what they call the funnest way of learning. So a lot of the younger kids are more interested in just making something that looks cool. But you should see the looks on their faces when they get their first robot to move. It's like a light turns on. And they suddenly go from quietly uncertain to exuberantly explaining their newfound insights to everyone and anyone who will listen multiple times. <laughs> this is really, really cool to witness. And let me tell you, it is so easy to sneak in some serious math and science at this point. And the kids will beg us for more. In fact, they blow right past all of the expectations that our education system has for them. And they'll learn curriculums that they won't even see in school for years. And the older kids, they learn specific skill sets that complement the theory that they've learned. This is hands-on learning that they are so excited about, you can't even stop them if you tried. Instead of teaching to a test, this type of holistic, team-based, project-based learning is teaching to a career. And it doesn't just prepare kids for the real world. They graduate from high school knowing what they want to do and why. And the best part is that it is so much fun. So I've seen kids convince their parents to uh, reschedule their family vacations, sometimes indefinitely. <laughs> all because they can't stand to miss a minute of this type of learning. 
I've frequently had parents tell me about how their kids are begging to stay up later at night or are neglecting their homework because they'd rather spend time working on research for their robotics team. These kids have come so far from boring and intimidating and hard to apply in real life. Did you ever feel this way about math and science? If not, maybe it's time you did. Because the best way to change these negative, elitist attitudes about math and science that permeate our society are to change your attitude. And the best way to relearn your attitude is to rediscover how fun math and science can be. Look around you. You're surrounded by passionate, willing mentors and teachers who would love to share their knowledge with someone. Maybe you are one. And if so, please, teach your passion to a kid. Because you never know. They just might be the next Einstein. Thank you.